good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Gagne and Gahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. I am now going to pass the mic over to our first presenter, Sylvia Santosa. Just before doing that, I just want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the questions will be answered at the end of this session at 2.45. Over to you, Sylvia. Okay, so thank you to everybody for attending. Um, I'm Dr. Sylvia Santosa, and I'm joined today with uh, Dr. Claudine Gauthier, and together we're going to be talking about uh, our study that's performed, that is funded by a PERFORM multidisciplinary grant entitled The Brain and Body, an Investigation of Their Interactions in Obesity. Go, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so according to the World Health Organization, 65% of the world's population lives in a country where obesity kills more people than underweight. So that's huge because in 2021, there were 7.8 billion people on this planet. And that means that for over 5 billion people, they live in a place not where starvation is an issue, but where overnutrition is. The high prevalence of obesity is especially concerning. As many of you know, there's a significant impact of obesity on our health and well being. Those with obesity have greater risk of various comorbidities and diseases, including cancer, uh, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory disorders, gastrointestinal disorders, musculoskeletal, type 2 diabetes, and neurological or psychosocial disorders. And it's the neurological or psychosocial disorders that we'll focus on today, because that is what is funded by our PERFORM multidisciplinary grant that aims to provide some insight as to how obesity might affect our neurological outcomes through examining how brain and whole body metabolism are connected. But before I get into the details, I wanted to provide you with some background as to why we're doing the study. According to the, 20, uh, to the 2015 Canadian community health surveys, one in three adults have obesity in Canada. And this is concerning because it's estimated to cost Canadians seven to $9 billion to treat obesity. And obesity in Canada is attributed to one in 10 premature deaths, as well as 2.5 years of uh, life expectancy lost. However, obesity does not affect males and females equally. In this graph, the prevalence of obesity in males is plotted on the x-axis against the prevalence of obesity in females for 151 countries, with each point representing one country. Points that lie along this line of identity have an equal prevalence of obesity in males and females. And as you can see from this graph, females are especially vulnerable to obesity. The reasons that females tend to be especially vulnerable to obesity is multifactorial and stems from a number of different factors, including behavioral, social, and physiological. Though physiologically, sex hormones have been shown to play a metabolically important role in the development of obesity and its associated comorbidities, we have yet to fully appreciate these differences. We know that with regards to obesity, there's a range of body shapes and at either end of the spectrum, we have males who tend to be apple shaped and females who tend to be pear shaped. We also see that when there's a shift in sex hormones, such as with the menopausal transition, body fat storage and distribution is also affected. More specifically with menopause in females, we switch from a predominantly lower body fat storage to a predominantly upper body fat storage. The shift in fat storage is significant because where we store fat is, is uh, affecting our comorbidities of obesity associated diseases. The upper body fat 
tends to contribute more to circulating non-esterified fatty acids or NEFAs in the blood in both males and females. And this is significant because circulating NEFAs have been implicated in increasing the risk of obesity-related comorbidities. Moreover, we recently published a paper in Obesity Reviews showing sex differences in regional adipose tissue, implicating that the manifestation of type 2 diabetes with obesity is different among males and females. At the whole body level, it's been shown that females with obesity have a lower daily energy expenditure, as you can see here. Interestingly, the decline in energy expenditure in aging, with aging has also been found to be greater in females than in males, suggesting a mechanism by which females might be at greater risk of obesity. With regards to substrate oxidation, carbohydrate and fat oxidation are reciprocal. That means as one goes up, the other one goes down. And at rest, what we have is we have greater fat oxidation and lower glucose oxidation. And normally, when you go from a fasting to a fed condition, there's a shift from, in, from fat oxidation or predominant fat oxidation to a predominantly glucose uh, oxidation. So an impairment in this shift has been implicated in insulin resistance and termed metabolic inflexibility. Impaired fat oxidation may also be an indicator of mitochondrial function and uh, result in lipid accumulation. Specifically, lower energy expenditure and fat oxidation have been shown to be predict weight gain in adults. In obesity, metabolic inflexibility has been observed, specifically higher fat oxidation and lower glucose oxidation compared to lean individuals. This indicates a, a physiological maladaptation in obesity. Sex steroids also affect substrate oxidation, specifically in females who are postmenopausal. There is a significantly higher, uh, I should say, significantly lower fat oxidation in the postmenopausal female compared to a premenopausal female. And also, as you can see here, though non significant, there's a slightly elevated carbohydrate oxidation as well. In males with low testosterone, we also see a lower fat oxidation compared to those with normal uh, testosterone levels. So, so far I've shown you that obesity affects metabolism and that the pathology of obesity in females is different than in males at the whole body level. Several investigations have also shown that obesity not only affects the whole body, but the brain as well. I'm going to go over it briefly here, but Dr. Gauthier will elaborate more during her part of the talk. So far, those who have investigated the effects of obesity on the brain have for the most part found decreases in gray and white matter in regions such as the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, and other subcortical areas. These decreases have been attributed to excessive adiposity as there are, they are present even after controlling for obesity-associated comorbidities such as diabetes. Most recently, a study, a large study done by Amin et al. published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease in 2020, analyzed over 35,000 brain spec scans in over 17,000 adults at baseline and during concentration tasks. They found a striking pattern which showed that greater BMI was associated with decreased perfusion in all brain regions at rest and during the concentration task. Low brain perfusion may be among several mechanisms underlying the functional associations between obesity and the brain, um, including decreases in cognition, in memory, and in executive performance, and increases in dementia, anxiety, and depression. Oxidative stress, inflammation, and abnormal brain lipid metabolism have also been thought to play a role. Specifically, ingestion of a fatty meal has been shown to decrease brain cerebral blood flow. Interestingly, diabetes has also been linked with cognitive decline, indicating that chronically high glucose levels might be associated with cognitive impairment and increases of dementia. Blood glucose peaks have also been shown to be related to cognitive impairment. However, it is unclear how whole body and brain metabolism are related. 
So the objective of our talk is to investigate the effects of obesity and regional fat distribution on the crosstalk between vascular and metabolic health in the brain and whole body factors during fasting and in response to a mixed meal in pre and postmenopausal females. To fulfill our objectives, we are recruiting individuals who are, or females I should say, who are pre and postmenopausal and who are normal weight and who have obesity. Prior to the study visits, participants meet with a dietitian at Perform and they have their diet evaluated and the study diet explained. Participants undergo also neuropsychological testing and they receive three days of meals to be consumed just prior to their study visit. As part of this protocol, we have two different types of study visits. One is the metabolic visit and the other is the MRI visit. During the metabolic visit, participants have an indirect, calor indirect calorimetry measurements and 24 hour urine collection in order to en examine energy expenditure and substrate oxidation. They also get a blood draw and we assess their body composition via dual x-ray absorbed geometry. For the indirect calorimetry measurements, participants arrive fasted and we get a baseline measurement after a period of rest. Then they consume a breakfast and then we repeat our indirect calorimetry measurements at 15, 30 and 60 minutes. And then after that, they get hourly indirect calorimetry measurements done for a period of six hours. So that concludes my part of the talk. Dr. Cotier will take over from here to discuss the brain aspects of the study. Thank you. Here, I'm just gonna... I think it is. Anyway, oh. we'll see. Okay, so uh, now we'll shift gear a little bit and talk about the brain imaging part of this. So the main outcome that we have in our study is really to try to understand what's happening in the brain in obesity and before and after this meal. So. Basically, we um, on the day of the MR, uh, the people have uh, the the participants will have uh, an MRI uh, fasted, and then they uh, take the same meal they had in the uh, metabolic uh, day, and then they get imaged again. And the whole uh, point of this imaging session is really to understand brain physiology. So the way people usually explore brain metabolism is by using oh no yes is by using the blood dependent, the blood oxygen level dependent signal. So this uh, type of imaging is, is very popular. It's very common. So it's the most commonly used functional imaging technique. And it's been developed in the 1990s and been very popular since then uh, because it's a very sensitive measure of, of brain activity and, and therefore of um, you know, how much metabolism there is in the brain. However, um, the bolt signal is dependent uh, not directly on metabolism, but on uh, hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a molecule that contains um, iron molecules, and these iron molecules have um, magnetic properties. So when, when hemoglobin is fully oxygenated, we say that it's diamagnetic, so it slightly increases the magnetic field, but more importantly, when it's deoxygenated, so when at least one oxygen has been used, it starts to have paramagnetic properties, so it decreases the amount of MRI signal we have. Um, so it causes a field disturbance that we can actually measure. And um, because deoxyhemoglobin is basically tells us how much oxygen is being removed. Um, you know, this means that the bolt signal is partly dependent on oxygen metabolism, right? How much oxygen has been removed from hemoglobin. But uh, one of the problems with the bolt signal is it's very ambiguous because um, the brain, when it uses oxygen, uh, it triggers a whole cascade of signaling, which, which actually increase blood flow in that area. So because the brain uh, knows that it needs to use, use more nutrients because some has been used, uh, this triggers a feed forward mechanism that leads to increased blood flow. So vasodilation that increases fresh blood entry into the area. And, and this blood flow response overcompensates for the amount of oxygen that's been used. And so basically what we measure is not so much the oxygen being removed by brain activity, but the blood flow increase that 
uh, happens after this brain activity. So what we measure is a dilution of deoxyhemoglobin. We measure an increase in oxyhemoglobin and a reduction in deoxyhemoglobin, which means that the Volt signal is metabolic in nature, but it's also vascular in nature. And that in fact, the biggest component of the Volt response is the blood flow component. And it also it, it's also dependent on blood volume. But the nice thing about uh, MRI is it's an extremely versatile tool and an MRI can actually be used to obtain much more uh, physiologically specific information that can tell us a lot about brain physiology. It, so there's techniques such as arterial spin labeling that can be used to measure blood flow. There's several techniques, including vaso and verve that can measure blood volume. And then there's um, a whole family of techniques also to measure oxidative metabolism. And the one we use in, in our lab is uh, calibrated fMRI. And today I'm gonna talk about these two techniques, which form kind of the, the most important part of the, the protocol uh, for body and brain. So a quick um, uh, slide on arterial spin labeling. So the idea here is uh, we have the head, we're trying to image inside the brain um, how much blood flow there is. And to be able to measure blood flow, what we do is we use um, a um, magnetic label, so an inversion pulse, a magnetic label at the level of the carotids that tags all the blood that comes into the brain. Then we wait for the blood to arrive in the brain, diffuse into tissue, and then we take an image of the brain. And that image will contain a small component that's due to blood flow. Then we do the same thing, but without tagging this time. So what we get is we get a control image, and then we get an image that contains a tag, so this magnetically labeled blood tag, and then we subtract the two and we get a perfusion weighted signal that we can use to quantify blood flow using a kinetic model. So that's the first one. Now, one of the other measures that we can uh, get out of the, the protocol that we're measuring is a cerebrovascular reactivity. So this is basically how much hemodynamic activity, it can be measured using either the Volt signal or this ASL perfusion signal in response to uh, carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. So if you give small amounts to people, um, it will cause vasodilation throughout the body, but also in the brain. This vasodilation will bring a fresh influx of oxyhemoglobin, which will dilute the deoxyhemoglobin that's there from resting metabolism and lead to an increase in Volt signal, which we can measure. And this is thought to be a measure of vascular reserve. So how elastic your arteries are, how, di how um, dilated they are at rest. So it's basically a measure of how much when, it's kind of a stress test for the, the brain in a way, how much can it di vasodilate when asked to? And, and that's a measure of vascular health. So serial blood flow and serovascular activity have been used in other contexts, and this is why we know they're important uh, markers of serovascular health. So for example, this is a study from a long time ago now uh, in aging, showing that, for example, older adults have decreased cerebral blood flow across their brain in aging. And then when we look at cerebrovascular activity, we find something similar where older adults have decreased cerebrovascular reactivity across the brain as compared to younger adults, showing a decrease in vascular reserve with age, right? So we know that at least something like age impacts these um, cerebrovascular parameters. And now the question here is, does obesity also do? And we don't really have anything on CVR so much, but there has been several studies looking at CBF and um, Sylvia mentioned one. So there's many others, several of which show something similar that obesity is associated with decrease in uh, cerebral blood flow across the brain. So for example, this study that showed the same thing. Um, then there's studies that show something a little bit more complex where there's regions that show an increase and regions that show a decrease. And that led in part to this idea of the obesity paradox, that obesity at least at some level might actually be protective for the brain in terms of a brain uh, structural integrity and a perfusion. And in fact, uh, in our lab, we've been uh, studying these effects and, and also the impact of sex. So we know that obesity has a very important sexual component. And uh, so we wanted to know if this relationship between obesity and the brain uh, in terms of perfusion was also influenced by the sex of the participant. And we did find that. So um, on the right here, we have in males where there's basically not much a relationship between uh, cerebral blood flow and BMI. But in females, however, and we found the same thing when we looked at uh, structural integrity, we find that um, there's definitely the presence, at least in this data set, of an obesity paradox whereby uh, females have an increased cerebral blood flow as, the, as their BMI increases. 
And, and it seems to be pretty much a linear relationship. So clearly there's complex effects happening here, which may depend on many things, including whether somebody is male or female, perhaps the part of their life they're in, whether if it's a female, whether they're menopaused or not. So clearly there's a lot of complexity in the link between obesity and perfusion in the brain. And, and part of the idea of body and brain is to try to understand some of these effects. So the second thing that we're trying to investigate in body and brain is uh, oxidative metabolism. So this is something that's been very little studied. In general, oxidative metabolism is not trivial to measure in the brain, uh, but, but even less in, in relationships to things like obesity. So, and in my lab, we use a calibrated fMRI technique uh, to measure this. And I'm just gonna give you a little primer on calibrated fMRI. So the idea here is we use the fact that we have MRI measures of cerebral blood flow and the bold signal, which contains both cerebral blood flow and oxidative metabolism to try to extract uh, oxidative metabolism. And, and to start with, uh, I can tell you about the basic model for calibrated fMRI that was developed in 1998 by Davis and then kind of the follow up to measure baseline metabolism. So the whole idea around calibrated fMRI is that you can use gas manipulation. So having people breathe increased concentration of carbon dioxide or oxygen to measure their, um, and to, which will link to, which will be, sorry, associated with changes in perfusion and bolt signal to try to extract the, uh, the metabolic component of the signal. So basically we use a breathing manipulation to uh, calibrate the signal, to uh, measure a calibration parameter, which is called M. And conceptually, M is basically um, at rest. You always, you always have deoxyhemoglobin in your brain because your brain is always active and, and therefore creates deoxyhemoglobin, which attenuates the bolt signal because of its paramagnetic properties. And now if somehow you could remove all that deoxyhemoglobin from the brain, um, you would get a massive bolt signal change. And M is this signal change that you would get if you removed all the oxyhemoglobin that's present at rest. And, and to do this, we use a breathing manipulation which will change the oxygen content either through vasodilation or by increasing the amount of oxygen. And then uh, we try to extrapolate to this M value. So it looks like this. So this is the basic model, which links a bold signal that we measure in response to a hypercapnia, so CO2 manipulation, to a cerebral blood flow change that we measure using ASL during this breathing manipulation. <coughs> Sorry. So, and this parameter M here is what we're trying to measure. So if you breathe CO2, it's gonna to lead to vasodilation. It'll increase perfusion. Because we're increasing perfusion or cerebral blood flow, this will dilute some of the resting deoxyhemoglobin without presumably changing metabolism. And so you'll have an increased perfusion and an increase in bolt signal that's independent of metabolism. So you'll basically get one point along this curve that links the bolt signal to the cerebral blood flow. And then we use this model, this Davis model, to basically extrapolate to the asymptote of this curve. And this asymptote is this M parameter, right? So you get one point that you fit into this model and that gives you the, the asymptote. And now you have your, your, your calibration parameter. And then in the original version of this model, what we were trying to do is measure metabolism in response to a task. So the idea here would be, uh, you have your line here that is the relationship between a change in blood flow and a change in bolt signal due to hypercapnia that doesn't change uh, metabolism. And then you do the same thing, you measure bold and cerebral blood flow during a task. And you basically get a point along a curve that's shifted downward from your other curve, because now, <clears throat> there's a component to your signal that's the extra de deoxyhemoglobin that you added by performing this task. And the distance between these two curves is, uh, is equivalent to the CMRO2, so the, the amount of oxygen that was used to perform this task. So that was the original model. You could only measure metabolism in response to a task. Um, but in uh, 2012, <clears throat> myself and other people simultaneously all developed a very similar model to, to actually measure metabolism at rest. And I am not going to go through the details of this model, but the idea is that there are underlying assumptions to this model about oxygen extraction fraction, which measures the balance between uh, oxidative metabolism and blood flow, and the, the amount of deoxyhemoglobin in venous blood. And if you make these assumptions explicit in the model, then you're able to create a, a 
another model, which basically contains two unknown parameters, this M parameter that we were trying to measure in the first place, but now we have a second unknown parameter, which is oxygen extraction fraction, which tells us again, the balance between oxygen extraction and cerebral blood flow. And basically this curve that I showed you, which was the relationship between bold and cerebral blood flow, you can now construct a similar relationship, but this time between M and oxygen extraction fraction, for any breathing manipulation. <clears throat> and as long as you have more than one breathing manipulation, basically the M and the oxygen extraction fraction in any voxel of the brain is independent of your breathing manipulation. And by constructing multiple of these curves, we can find the intersection and we can solve for multiple unknowns by having multiple um, equations constructed from uh, multiple breathing manipulations and basically uh, by doing this, we can find what the oxygen extraction fraction in every voxel of the brain is. And now if we know the perfusion at rest from uh, our arterial spin labeling scan, we can basically through a mass balance equation, just get CMRO2, which is the cerebral metabolic rate of O2. So the amount of O2 that you use um, per minute at rest, <coughs> sorry. And so we've used this technique um, in, for example, uh, carotid artery disease recently. So uh, this is data from another study um, where we showed that uh, carotid artery disease patients have lower CMRO2 than, than controls. So their oxygen metabolism is lower in their brain as compared to controls and that um, their oxygen extraction fraction, which is uh, which tends to be very stable in the brain, uh, is slightly reduced. So that would tell us that their metabolism is affected a little bit more than their perfusion. So we want to do something similar here, but in obesity. So, <clears throat> so Sylvia showed you the design of the experiment, and now I'm going to show you a little bit of preliminary results we have. So because of the pandemic, we weren't able to start this, um, this study until very recently, but we do have a couple of participants, so one lean and one obese that I can show you some, some partial results in at least. So as I said, we have two participants that we have the, the full complement of data. So, in, so we uh, have one lean, one obese, uh, one is premenopausal and the other one is postmenopausal. We measure um, a variety of factors also in this study that we didn't really mention, including uh, arterial stiffness measurements. So this is measured using tonometry. So we can also link um, kind of vascular risk factors that we measure um, to the, the changes that we see in the brain in obesity to see how much of it is due to, for example, arterial stiffening and try to understand really the physiology behind what we see. And then we of course have a full neuropsychological battery um, which, you know, I'm not showing the results here, but, but we also, of course, uh, have a full investigation of cognition also to, tr to understand uh, what's happening there. So, sorry. Okay, right. so uh, this is an example from just our first participant, just to show you what the indirect uh, calorimetry looks like. So by doing in this indirect calorimetry over time, we're able to look at uh, carbohydrate oxidation and fat oxidation over time. Um, and we can see here that uh, fat oxidation is very low for the first hour, and then it increases and, and kind of remains stable for a while, whereas uh, carbohydrate uh, oxidation peaks at one hour and then kind of goes down to reach a plateau. And this point at one hour post meal is when we're really targeting our imaging. So we're trying to make sure that the people are in the scanner with the mask on and that we're doing this calibrated fMRI um, um, framework that measures cerebral blood flow, cerebral vascular activity, and oxygen metabolism exactly at that point to really capture the effects of the meal at the point of peak carbohydrate oxidation. And one of the, the um, ideas here is to understand the effects of uh, you know, differences in obesity on carbohydrate uh, oxidation and fat oxidation on how uh, the impact on the brain and also because uh, we know that um, um, glucose also has vasoactive properties, which we can uh, potentially capture here. So here are the maps for um, our first participant. So that was the obese participant. So a, a note here is that uh, uh, some of these maps uh, are difficult to interpret in single individuals. So, you know, based on 
um, a nonlinear model, which, which can be a little bit difficult to fit really at the voxel wise level. So you have to be careful really interpreting too much uh, maps from single people. Uh, I think the, the results become much more stable if we look at regions or uh, across groups, but still as a as kind of a first sight, we can see that serial blood flow, which we can definitely look in, in single people, uh, seems to be slightly decreased, for example, after the meal, while serovascular reactivity seems to be increased after the meal. Now the CMR2 and OEF are the ones that might be a little bit more, um, need to be a little bit more carefully interpreted, but it does look like CMR2 is decreased um, after the meal, and while oxygen extraction fraction uh, is also decreased, indicating that the effect on metabolism is greater than the effect on flow, for example, which is basically what we see here. And then if we look, oops, sorry, at uh, our second participant, uh, so this was the lean participant, uh, we see something similar, though uh, perhaps interestingly, the effect of the meal on cerebral blood flow, which is again the the, the parameter which is potentially most interpretable at the single um, individual level, seems to be a bit more complex in this person, where uh, we see some increases but some decreases as well, indicating that perhaps uh, there will be some regional effects. Uh, CVR shows the same pattern, but again, difficult to interpret in a single person. And then the metabolic maps uh, seem to show the opposite, as in the obese participant, which is very interesting, but of course, very difficult to interpret at this single uh, person level. So uh, we're really looking forward to seeing more, more of these results in the future. So uh, right now, we don't have too many results to show, unfortunately, but, uh, but I think the the point that we wanted to get across is that this, uh, this study is really the first to, to try to really comprehensively look at these effects of um, the, the prandial state, so whether somebody has just eaten or not, in obese, non-obese people, and uh, across the menopausal transition, which, which is where we see a lot of these changes in body fat storage, for example. So the effect of obesity on the brain is currently very unclear. So for example, we don't really know what happens to brain metabolism at all. And, and what happens to blood flow is also very unclear and seems to depend on many factors which haven't really been systematically investigated. Clearly, a lot of these effects are dependent on sex. And so we decided to focus on, on females in this study and uh, really try to uh, investigate the effect of hormone and menopause uh, on these uh, relationships between obesity and, and brain metabolism and, and cerebrovascular health. And, and I think one of the things that's, that's very interesting with this study is that we're really looking at both the fasting and the postprandial state, right? So in most of our lives, we're in this postprandial state where we've just where we've eaten the meal not too long ago, and it's really important, I think, to to really investigate that in a systematic way, since there's a good chance that um, the meal itself has an impact on the measurements that we make, right? So that by being very systematic in, in not only controlling what people eat before the study, but when we do the measurements compared to the meal, uh, we'll be able to investigate some of that physiology that, that perhaps is making a lot of those results in the literature, uh, you know, not, not agree between the different studies. So, so again, I think what this study really brings is it's a very comprehensive study of the physiology and the relationship between uh, obesity and the brain and the impact of uh, the meal on, on these effects. And to finish, I just want to thank you, the team that acquires and analyzes this data and, and all the support uh, from PERFORM. Thank you. So as um, Wendy said earlier, the questions will be uh, kept for uh, the Q&A session at the end. So, um, and maybe Wendy can be there because I think we finished a little bit early. So I'm not sure what you want to do in terms of uh, breakdown. Uh, yes, we finished a little early, uh, which just gives uh, people a bit more of a break. Uh, so we're going to take a break until uh, our next talk at uh, two o'clock. So thank you everyone for joining and we hope to see you uh, shortly. Hi everyone. Um, I think I can start, right, Wendy? All good to go. Okay, good. So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our keynote today, who uh, is 
Professor uh, Stephen Kinan, who is professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Sherbrooke and a researcher at the Research Center on Aging. And uh, Dr. Kinan is a very uh, influencing researcher who's really um, um, had done very important work in understanding the link between uh, metabolism and uh, cognitive aging and really showing that um, not only is metabolism affected in aging and dementia, but that we can use uh, the changes in metabolism to, to try to treat some of these effects. So really looking at uh, ketone bodies and how um, ketone bodies can be used to, uh, to pr pr uh, partially reverse the effects of cognitive aging. So uh, he's been extremely um, 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 productive in his career. So he's published over 350 papers and five books. And uh, he's a recognized expert. He's been elected to the French Academy of Medicine in 2009. In 2016, he became fellow of the International Society for the Study of Fatty Acids and Lipids. And in 2017 was offered the Chevreuil Medal from the French Society for the Study of Lipids. And uh, we're very much looking forward to listening to your extremely interesting work on um, ketone metabolism in Alzheimer's disease. Thank you very much for accepting to come uh, to talk at our conference. Well, thanks very much, uh, Claudine. It's a pleasure to be here. I've enjoyed a couple of the earlier uh, PERFORM meetings uh, in person when, when we were able to get together. Uh, and I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful environment, it's a wonderful concept, the PERFORM Center, I think, uh, looking at lifestyle and, and, uh, and technologies and, and trying to improve uh, our, our opportunities for a healthy uh, lifestyle and, and, uh, and for aging. Um, so, and your talk with uh, Sylvia uh, just beforehand, I think sets the stage for the metabolic uh, studies that we're, I'm gonna talk about um, and, and the, uh, the use of imaging. So my, my title is, is, uh, has got a question mark on it. Um, brain energy rescue is the one I wanna talk about. Um, some progress we've made with this, some progress that other people have made. The big question is going to be over the next five years or so um, in, in what we're doing, can we slow down Alzheimer's disease? And what I'd like to share with you is some evidence that we have um, from multimodal neuroimaging that we've done as to why the ketones are having the effects that, that we see. I'll start with my disclosures, which is that we have uh, funding from public sector, private sector, and nonprofit organizations. And I want to make it clear that this talk is, is not about medical or nutritional advice. It's a research talk uh, for to, to be shared to discuss uh, research advances and not specifically policy or, or that anyone should take uh, personally. So when we think about nutrition uh, and lifestyle uh, and cognition during aging, I think on the left here, are a couple of the key words that I would use in a search. If I were looking up this area, finger is one of the big and most impressive studies that's been done so far that involves a, a component of lifestyle intervention. I the Mediterranean diets right. are quite popular now um, for uh, dietary management. They're mostly observational at this point, uh, epidemiological, but some progress on the uh, RCT front as well, as with the MIND study out of Chicago. And they involve B vitamins, they involve omega-3 fatty acids. And I think perhaps one of the key important components is uh, reduced uh, sugar intake. So I, wanted... I think your slides are not going forward. Oh. We're still uh, seeing your title slide. Okay, so um, that's too bad. Let's um, escape and start over, shall we? Maybe I should, uh, is it not sharing? Um, it's sharing, but only the title slide. Okay, we just did it before and it seemed to work. Yeah, uh, now it's working, now it's working. Okay, so the title slide, my disclosures, uh, the idea that nutrition is involved in brain aging and may be beneficial, the, the main studies that have been done so far, the finger study and the ongoing work with the Mediterranean diet and mind, uh, and, and the emphasis has been on omega-3 fatty acids, B vitamins, and reduced sugar intake. And um, so still, is it working okay um, now? Yes, it's working great. 
Great. So what I want to share with you today is that these are our, I'll just put my pointer back on, um, that these are these nutrients are important part of, of brain development, important part of brain function. But I want, what I want to share with you is that one of the components that's been somewhat overlooked, I would say, uh, is, is that energy requirements change with aging. And, and let's, uh, we'll talk about that today. So the, the classical uh, situation is that we, we know there's a problem with brain energy metabolism in Alzheimer's disease. It's been one of the early, uh, it starts early, uh, it's a significant issue and it's been well known for over 40 years. So if we look at a, a PET scan of a, of, a, of a normal brain and we see this distribution of orange and, and uh, reddish uh, color, it, it, it indicates glucose uptake by the active tissue of the brain and, and is not in the, in the ventricles. And this represents a, a, a demand for energy of glucose primarily of 100 to 125 grams per day. If we look at the Alzheimer brain under the same circumstances, you see these big areas above the ears, the parietal cortex, um, which have a, a marked deficit in glucose uptake. And this represents in mild cognitive impairment, a problem of about 10%. And in Alzheimer's disease near the beginning of the disease, about 20%, and, and as the disease progresses up to 40%. So 40% of 100 grams is, is 40 grams a day of glucose that's not getting into the brain, which is quite a significant deficit. The way this has been interpreted is that it's, it's the cart, in the, in, the, in the cart and horse type of situation. But I put three little dots there for, for a reason. So what we're looking at is the problem here in the parietal cortex compared to what we see more in the frontal cortex. And the perception has been that Alzheimer's disease starts with the neuropathology and the cell deterioration, cell death. And this leads to cognitive decline. And this leads to lower brain energy uptake, low brain glucose uptake. So that by far the dominant view has been that it's a consequence of the disease. Well, it may be the horse, it may be the, the horse as well, or the cart, whichever one you want, um, in the sense that there is important evidence that I'll show you on the next slide, showing that the problem with glucose uptake in the brain actually starts before cognitive decline. And so that you're contributing to an energy deficit, which may be contributing to the neuropathology and the cognitive decline. And eventually you might be setting up a vicious cycle. So what is the evidence that there's a problem in people at risk of Alzheimer's disease? Well, people that are over 60 years old have, uh, in general, almost everyone has a lower brain glucose uptake. People with a family history of Alzheimer's disease in their 60s, People with insulin resistance as young as 25 years old, and I'm gonna come back to this at the end of my talk. Those with a genetic risk in the form of, of carrying the ApoE4 allele of a problem at 30 years old, but they have no cognitive problem uh, uh, yet, as do those that have the highest uh, the risk because of the mutation, the pre one -pre mutation. They all have declining brain glucose uptake before the onset of the cognitive decline. So our perception is that this um, is definitely part, is contributing to the problem, and, and we should be looking at ways that we can prevent it. And the question, the additional question we asked is that we've only had in the past glucose, the glucose tracer FDG to look at this problem. So what about ketone uptake? Because ketones are the brain's main alternative fuel to glucose. What do we know about that problem? So ketones or ketone bodies are derived primarily from dietary or stored fats. And the example I'll be using today is a medium chain triglyceride or abbreviated MCT containing C8 and C10 carbon fatty acids. Nowadays, you can go on the internet and buy ketone salts and ketone esters. Both will give rise to, in the one case, the endogenous ketones produced from adipose tissue, uh, fatty acids in adipose tissue will produce acetoacetate, but it's in equilibrium with the beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the one you would buy uh, if you buy off the internet the salts or, or the esters. So they're in equilibrium. I'm gonna talk mainly about their impact on fuel metabolism, but they are also important brain lipid substrates. Uh, they're involved in signaling uh, and histone uh, uh, epigenetics. And so, uh, there, there's a more complex story that I won't have time to describe today. We were inspired by the role of 
ketones in infant brain development to look at the medium chain fatty acids as a source of ketones. Infants depend on ketones for normal brain development. So they're in mild ketonemia or hyperketonemia at birth. And for several uh, months, it's a totally normal situation. The ketones are coming from mean, medium chain fatty acids in the mother's milk and from long chain fatty acids in the infant fat stores. Ketone uptake is very rapid in the infant brain compared to the adult brain. And in addition to being a fuel, oh, sorry, uh, that'll come in the next point, but the ketones supply uh, about 30% of fetal and neonatal energy requirements for the brain 24 seven. So this is a, a constant, this is not an alternative fuel, this is an essential fuel in the developing brain. And ketones are also supplying a great percentage, a high percentage of the carbon used to make brain lipids and the myelin, the white matter that you see in the brain, which is quite rich in cholesterol and saturated fatty acids. I wanna share with you three slides with three sort of basic principles of ketone metabolism. First is that glucose is brought into the brain by a pull mechanism. It's the brain that decides how much glucose gets in through the glucose transporter in relation to the utilization of glucose to make ATP. So this is what we call a pull mechanism. Ketones get into the brain via a push mechanism. When they're elevated in the blood, it's a signal that there's a need for them, probably a deficit in glucose, like during uh, food restriction or caloric restriction, uh, and ketones are pushed into the brain via a different transporter called the monocarboxylic acid transporter, which unfortunately has the same acronym as for medium chain triglyceride. So that's the first principle. The second principle, uh, so, sorry, that's the second principle. The third one is that ketones are actually uh, able to spare brain glucose metabolism. So in a situation where you put uh, healthy adults in short-term nutritional ketosis with a ketogenic diet, the delta brain ketone uptake, as you increase the availability of ketones going into the brain, you decrease the uptake of glucose. Uh, it's less of an effect in the subcortical nuclei and it's more of an important effect in the frontal and occipital lobes, but this is a very strong negative correlation. So what ketones do is spare glucose. So uh, sort of in, in a mini summary at this point, the brain is really functioning or trying to function like a hybrid car in the sense that the gasoline engine is running uh, on glucose and the ketones are so coming from the electric system and the battery and the electric motor. Glucose is normally supplying two thirds or more of, of the energy requirements, but during energy restriction or carbohydrate restriction, ketones can rapidly pick up the slack. The problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that there's a, we're not getting enough glucose into the brain in people that are at risk of Alzheimer's or at the beginning of the disease. And what we wanted to explore was whether or not brain ketone uptake was affected. So we developed uh, over 10 years ago now uh, a dual tracer PET uh, program uh, in Sherbrooke, whereby we used the uh, ketone tracer uh, C11 acetoacetate. We gave that tracer first over 30 minutes, it was a washout period. And then we gave the classical glucose tracer FDG for the, the next uh, 60 minutes. We acquired the MR data for anatomical volumetric resting state functional MR and diffusion imaging uh, separately. And most importantly, we collected blood samples throughout this process so that we could quantify the magnitude of the problem in the brain. So that would give us a therapeutic goal as to how much of a problem we're trying to solve and, and to what extent we achieve that. So in summary, in a cross-sectional study, the healthy age match controls, the mild cognitive impairment, and the Alzheimer groups, these are uh, mean values for the entire group with approximately 20 people per group. The capacity or the K value for glucose going into the brain, instead of the normal values that you see here in the controls in MCI, you start to see this green zone coming into the parietal cortex and it gets more severe in Alzheimer's disease. So this is a significant decrease in glucose uptake in the parietal cortex. This has been known and shown uh, in thousands of, of patients now. So. Our, our patients in, in Sherbrooke were no different than anybody else's. What we were able to show at the same time, however, is that ketone uptake by the brain did not decrease across these three groups. 
The values start out lower because in people consuming 50 to 60% of calories as, as, as carbohydrate, ketones are, are definitely a secondary fuel. So their uptake values are lower than the, than, the, than the glucose values, which are up in the orange here. But most importantly, they do not decrease in MCI. And in fact, in some individuals, we saw quite a significant increase in the capacity to transport ketones into the brain from the blood in Alzheimer's disease suggesting that there was some sort of a craving, an energy deficit that was they were, the body was, the brain was trying to compensate for by activating ketone transport. So this led to us doing the study we call Benefic, which has been on the, um, the clinical trials website for some time now. It's been completed. Our last paper came out this year um, and it was started in 2015. It was done in two phases. The first phase was done with Alzheimer's Association funding in which we did the brain imaging I've just described and the cognitive evaluation. We did a six month intervention, did the imaging again afterwards and the cognitive evaluation afterwards. In the second phase of the study with support from Nestle Health Science, we dropped the imaging because a number of participants were, were less interested to be involved in that. And we did a metabolic evaluation, which I'll show you. Uh, again, they went through the same intervention with exactly the same treatment and the metabolic study and cognitive evaluation at the end. So we had a completed 39 people on the active treatment and 43 people on the placebo. The active was the same MCT medium chain triglyceride with a ketogenic component C8 and C12, providing 30 grams, so 15 grams twice a day. And the placebo was a high oleic acid sunflower oil, which was not ketogenic exactly the same volume, organically, elliptically, uh, indistinguishable, a drink that we developed uh, in Sherbrooke and, and used throughout this study. The demographics were that uh, basically you'll see there's no difference in the male-female ratio, the APOE, uh, the age, education, global depression score, physical activity, uh, cognitive evaluation, and in some other parameters that might be relevant. Um, and these were a mixed amnestic and non-amnestic MCI population, most of whom, whom had a memory deficit, but not all. So the first question we wanted to ask and, and answer uh, was when we give a ketogenic supplement over six months, is the body able to actually produce ketones from it over that period of time? And this graph on the left shows that indeed over four hours, the rise in ketones is equivalent afterwards, in fact, slightly greater, although not statistically, after uh, the, treat, the six month treatment period than at the beginning. So the capacity to produce ketones when you are provided with an oral dose of, of ketogenic MCT uh, still persists, it doesn't sort of wash out. So that was uh, one important uh, parameter to establish. It's also clear that it's a transitory effect. So once you go into ketosis, you're back out of ketosis within three hours or so. At the time that it's elevated here in the blood, we can see the ketones are going into the brain as well, using the brain ketone PET imaging, something that we didn't see on placebo. So, so far so good in terms of the metabolic physiology. Also for those that are interested in this type of work, it's not essential to set up ketone PET imaging. In fact, there's a very good correlation on R of 0.8 uh, between the blood levels of ketones and the brain uptake of ketones. So the blood levels alone, if you can make those measurements, this sort of study can be done in a place that does not have PET imaging necessarily. So the bottom line in this study was what was going on with the cognitive scores. And I say here, it, there was improvement on five out of five major cognitive domains. I'm showing three uh, results here for episodic memory, which is the main one that's related to the development and progression of Alzheimer's disease, executive function or, or problem solving and language. And what we're showing is the Delta score here, placebo didn't change, MCT group went up by one word out of 16 with a, a p-value of 0.047. The executive function verbal fluency actually deteriorated a little bit on the placebo group and improved a bit on the, uh, uh, the MCT group and also for the uh, language tests of so the Boston naming test. So we see an improvement in all, in all these three domains with the KMCT. We also see 
because we made the measurements of both brain and plasma ketone uptake that the memory domain, the executive function domain, and the language domain all improved in relation to the change in plasma ketones. So ketones on the x-axis, cognitive performance on the y-axis in a delta versus delta. Clearly, there's an overlap between the placebo group and the KMCT group. And when we started this study, we didn't know how much KMCT to give. And so we gave the maximum tolerated dose, but clearly 30 grams a day of KMCT does not necessarily increase ketones in everyone. But still there's a significant positive relationship with the memory executive function and language. So we see a mechanistic link and would suggest that if we, those who were able to produce more ketones had a slightly better effect on cognition. I mentioned that it improved five out of five domains. This is the fourth domain I'm gonna talk about now for the next couple of slides. What we're showing here is the pattern of the white matter tracks in the brain. And I think this is the first time anyone has, has assessed energy metabolism in the white matter tracks. What we're showing here is the ketone uptake by them. It's a bluish uh, green color, which is down here at about 20 micromoles per gram per minute. And after the KMC treatment, you can see that it goes up into the orange, uh, yellow to orange. So we're, we've gone up to nearly 70 uh, micromoles per gram per minute uh, in these white matter tracts. So the gray matter is completely excluded from these images. And what we see is that the fourth domain here, in white matter, the processing speed improves in relation to the uptake of ketones in the white matter tracts or vesicles. So specifically the vesicles, vesicles that are, are uh, in which we see this relationship are the ones shown here on the right. So the corpus callosum, the inferior frontal and so on. You'll notice that two of the ones shown here are not shown on the, uh, on the glass brain. And that's because there was no significant, pardon me, um, the, the um, posterior cingulate and the uncinate they're not statistically different. There's a moderately good relationship in the case of the uncinate, but what we're seeing here is a relationship of a correlation of about 0.5 between the uptake of ketones in these vesicles versus the change in processing speed. So this is something that wasn't clear from a, an overall um, um, examination of the whole global uptake of the ketones by the brain. But once you tease out the white matter, you can see that the myelin based uh, uh, ketone uptake is, seems to be improving directly in relation to the processing speed uh, that, that they show on the cognitive tests. And the fifth domain was attention in which with functional MRI, we can uh, map out certain networks in the brain, which are shown here and, and on, the, uh, on the right as well. And the, the only one that was statistically significant between the placebo and the KMCT group was what's called the DAN or the dorsal attention network. And the functional connectivity within the dorsal attention network was significantly improved after the KMC treat, C treat, treatment. And this is correcting for intracerebral volume, white matter uh, hyperintensities and so on. This was just published this year in Neurobiology of Aging. And we see that within this particular network, the dorsal attention network, that the connectivity is a direct function of the uptake of ketones with, within this network. So if you only do the fMRI, this is the image you get. But when you are able to do them both with the ketone metabolism as well, you can superimpose one map on the other. And you can see that in fact, when they're compared across individuals, that there's a direct positive relationship between the ketone uptake in this network and the functional connectivity across the regions of this network. And the improvements in ketone uptake and functional connectivity are related to the cognitive, uh, the, the uh, co composite score, pardon me, uh, for attention and processing speed and the trail making test. So the trail making test is going faster here. So we're seeing a drop in the values. It's an inverse correlation with the functional connectivity um, and also with the number sequencing test, again, um, accomplished quicker. So functional connectivity in this, uh, the DAN and the attention um, domain and the ketone uptake are all directly related. We're not the only people to have worked in this area. Uh, this is a, a, an overview of some of the 
papers that have been published, uh, people working in Alzheimer's disease with uh, ketogenic MCT, people working on the ketogenic diet in MCI, ketogenic diet in Alzheimer's disease, and so on. The endpoints in some cases were cognition, in some cases a question of feasibility, because the ketogenic diet is quite restrictive and not well tolerated by people in their 70s and 80s. Still, an improvement on the ADAS-COG, an improvement on certain memory functions, and in, interestingly, in, in Susan Kraft's work that was published last uh, two years ago now, some neuropathology markers in the CFF were, CSF were also improved. So there is work in this area. It's still uh, at the beginning, but it's emerging and it's encouraging to see other progress in this field as well. So when we look at what's going on with this vicious cycle, I would say that brain, the brain energy deficit is a correctable determinant of Alzheimer's disease. The problem is pre-existing, but it's glucose specific. That's still a big problem. It's still in a very important restriction for the brain, but at least there's a way out. And this is contributing to the neuropathology. It's contributing to the cognitive symptoms, the cognitive decline and the synaptic degeneration are causing a worsening of the brain energy deficit. The neuropathology is probably worsening the brain energy deficit as well. And so this becomes a vicious cycle that we seem to be able to interrupt early in the disease during MCI. Whether we can interrupt it later in, in the disease, uh, it may be possible. If it's possible, it's, it's the logistical aspects of making it work that are a big challenge right now. So this is the optimistic side of it, that this is a correctable determinant uh, of Alzheimer's disease. There is still, however, a black cloud looming over us, and it's, it relates to the talk that was just given by Claudine and Sylvia, and that is that uh, in women, and it it's just an example. I'm sure this is the same a problem with, with men with insulin resistance, but we looked at women with polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, 24 years old, actually with a normal BMI. Typically people, uh, women with polycystic ovary tend to be overweight, but these were normal BMIs. They had at this age already a mild deficit in working memory. And they had a 10% decline in glucose uptake in the parietal cortex in green and the temporal cortex in blue and even higher decline in the frontal cortex here in red. This decline is typical of Alzheimer's disease and this decline is typical of aging. So what it suggests is that insulin resistance in individuals as young as 24 years old causes a sort of premature metabolic aging of the brain. Again, I repeat that we studied uh, women who, because we had uh, information on their insulin resistance, but I have no doubt this problem is, is equally prevalent in, in young men with, with insulin resistance as well. So the dark cloud on this is that insulin resistance is not restricted to the elderly. It's very prevalent, unfortunately, uh, in younger adults, middle-aged adults, and even in adolescents. And it's going to be a problem that's going to confront the treatment of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease uh, into the future. So I'd like to wrap up. Uh, by uh, just giving you an overview of this, uh, my talk. First of all, I think it's important to realize that the problem with brain energy metabolism is not simply a consequence of the disease. I provocatively said, is it the cart or the horse? In fact, uh, I, I think it's probably both, but it is there early in the disease and it contributes to a vicious cycle. Our data have been confirmed by gene expression analysis published by Sato et al. in Alzheimer's and Dementia last year. So I'm quite certain that, that this is not a specific effect uh, that we can see on PET imaging that is somehow artifactual, but is rather can be confirmed by other types of analyses. Uh, whether, whether or not we can see it on imaging, the clear, uh, clearly the results on cognition are encouraging in mild cognitive impairment, so there is a beneficial effect that seems to be related to the dose of ketones that are available. And, and a drink based on our formulation has now been launched and is available in, primarily in Europe at the moment under the name brain expert. Ketones may all be involved uh, in, in slowing down the disease progression, the neuropathology. This remains to be confirmed, but it's, um, it's a possibility that uh, it deserves further research. And it's important to realize that insulin resistance is probably contributing to this problem, um, and it may be affecting brain glucose uptake. It is certainly, uh, and it's certainly independent of age. So if we've got any aspirations to try and delay 
or treat or prevent Alzheimer's disease with lifestyle interventions. I think ketones are gonna be part of the solution, but we're gonna to have to improve insulin sensitivity. And this means reducing carbohydrate intake and increasing exercise. And this needs to be further studied in larger, longer RCTs. So thank you very much for your participation. And uh, I look forward to uh, some discussion about this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kinnan. That was very interesting. Um, just to remind all the participants, if you have any questions, please enter them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So that's any questions for any of the presenters this afternoon. So we'll give a couple minutes just for, for people to enter their questions. I can start with a question. Um, thanks for your talk, Dr. Kunain. That was very interesting. And I was just wondering, can you elaborate on the um, intervention that you used in terms of the supplements that you gave? So were they advised of other dietary restrictions to, to, in order to induce the ketogenesis? Or um, like I couldn't tell whether it was like a chronic or it was a single supplement type of study. Presumably there was some of each. Um, and then the other question I have for you is whether you saw actually any sex differences with regards to your, to your results. Thanks for the question. And uh, maybe I, I ran over the material a bit too quickly, but um, so chronic or acute, uh, it's a six month intervention, which is relatively long, uh, twice a day. So they take the drink, the ketones go up, they end up coming down. They take it at breakfast and at lunch, uh, at supper. Mo most people took it at breakfast and, and supper. There was, we did not advise them to change their diet or, or any aspect of lifestyle. Nevertheless, 30 grams of MCT is, is nearly 300 kilocalories of energy. Body weight did not change. So one would have to assume that something else in their dietary pattern probably changed a little bit. I'm not sure what it was. Uh, we didn't uh, try to probe that. So it's a, it's a, and the second part of your question was, um, remind me again. differences. Yeah, no, we didn't see anything, but uh, I'm sure you, you'd realize that with this number of participants, um, we probably wouldn't necessarily see a, a sex difference. Uh, we didn't see any effect of the APOE4 uh, allele, which has often been sort of given all sorts of nasty attributes, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I don't know whether there's an effect there, but the, the study was not powered for APOE or even for sex differences. Okay, thank you. So we have one question from uh, Dr. Benali. Uh, he said, thank you for this talk. Do you think that lactate could help supplement energy in ED patients? What is the link between ketone uptake and tau protein load? I'll answer the first question, but I didn't quite hear the, the, the last part of the second question. What is the, the, the link between ketone uptake and something? And tau protein. Ah. Um, so uh, could, could lactate be interesting? Well, it, 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 he's speculating and I, and I would be speculating in my response. Um, I've been intrigued by the, the possibility. I, the brain is an opportunistic user of ketones in adults and it's an opportunistic user of lactate. If you're a serious athlete, an elite athlete uh, producing lots of lactate in your muscle when you're exercising, uh, the brain can use basically every millimole of lactate that your muscle produces. So, uh, you know, most, most Alzheimer's patients are not elite athletes. So uh, the, the extent to which the brain can use that amount of lactate is, is, is unknown. Um, and, and we'll have to see. Uh, that, so I, I can't answer it really, but I, I think potentially lactate could be important uh, for some aspects of AT, rapid ATP generation by aerobic glycolysis. Ketones cannot produce uh, ATP by aerobic glycolysis. So there may be an advantage to having a lactate source as well. As far as tau is concerned, um, we, we don't know. Um, I, I don't know if anyone who's actually studied that question in, in humans. Uh, tau protein does go down in, in transgenic mice that are on a ketogenic diet or on a ketone ester treatment. There's, a, I think, at least five papers on this now. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt because transgenic models don't always pan out in humans. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Patricia Dudar. 
As a distance runner over 70, I need carbs to run. I am far from being overweight. So what applies to my diet? So what applies to my diet? That's correct. As a distance runner over 70, she says she needs carbs to run. She's far from being overweight. So what would apply to her diet? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I mean, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, continue running for sure. Uh, your body is going to need the carbs uh, for muscle. Uh, absolutely. Um, if, if the question is, should you be taking fewer carbs and, and increasing fat intake in order to reduce your risk of insulin resistance? I think by running, you're probably uh, taking largely taking care of insulin resistance. Although people, it depends on whether you've got type two diabetes because some people with type two diabetes cannot outrun their insulin resistance. Uh, I think this has been established. So at some point, if you're a type two, if you're diabetes prone, type two diabetes prone, reducing carbs at some point is gonna be important. Uh, that's maybe gonna conflict with the energy needs for running. And I, I don't pretend to know how, how to balance that, but um, those, are, those are issues that I, I'm not, able to answer directly. Great, thank you very much. And uh, so uh, there are no open questions at the moment. Uh, we will just give a few uh, more minutes. Can, can I throw one out there or do I have to behave and, and use a little? Um, <laughs> you're, you're more than welcome to throw some out there for other speakers as well or to the audience. I don't actually see where the hand thingy is, uh, but maybe, but uh, whatever. That's okay, you um, can just go like that. <laughs> I just wanted to congratulate Sylvia and Claude Zinn on, on the work you're doing. It's it's a very demanding technique, it seems to me, uh, a lot of math. And, and as soon as you start throwing formulas at me, I, I get all fuzzy. But um, I, I'm really glad to see this type of intervention and, and that you're probing it with some physiological endpoint. Um, because, you know, <laughs> I think it, it adds a, a, an important dimension to the information you're going to be gathering. And, and I'm it's great to see. Well, and, and I think, you know, the work you do is, um, is also complemented, I think, by these oxidative um, metabolism techniques, because that's the one thing that's very difficult, even with PET to measure, because it requires O15 that has such a short half-life, right? So there's, in fact, not that many people looking at this uh, using PET, and now there's emerging MRI techniques, which I hope can complement all the work you do with PET, right? Yeah because oxygen usage also is a very important component of how the brain works and that, that we haven't been able to probe as much because it's been so technically challenging. Yep. Well, the, I mean, the pet has, has, has taken us a, a, a long ways and I'm, I'm very proud of the work that we've done with it. But I don't think at this point, if, if, I, if someone was to th throw a million dollars at some research center like yours to do a project on, on Alzheimer's and, and uh, interventions, the PET is, I think is, is not an essential component anymore. I think we've got enough information to say, let's act on the cognitive endpoints because the information is out there. We don't need to duplicate and put all that layer of, of complexity into it. Um, with your fMRI, it's, um, I'm not sure what the time component is, but it's probably not as long as ours. Um, and so, but, it's still more feasible and probably not as costly as, as what we're doing. Um, no. A dual tracer PET scan for us is, is $5,000. And it's uh, so it adds up really quickly. That's true. Well, you know, nobody would want to stay in the MRI for 10 hours, I guess. <laughs> um, but I, I guess you'll be able to distinguish at some point between those that have uh, type are diabetes prone, have, have insulin resistance and those that don't. And, and that would be a, a, an area that I would be very interested to see because diabetes is the most important controllable risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Yes, so definitely that's a, that's a very important component of what we're doing in that study and in all the other studies. And it's very prevalent, clearly extremely important to look at. Yeah. yeah, so because it has such an influence on substrate oxidation and things, it's definitely something that we're going to be measuring. We're not going to specifically be recruiting individuals with, you know, type 2 diabetes. In fact, it is an exclusion criteria for us. But what we do want to see is we want to see, well, what if people tend to be a little bit, uh, you know, more or less insulin resistant in, in obesity? We'll definitely measure that with the blood outcomes that we look at. It's like studying MCI instead of the full-blown disease. You're, you try and catch them on the uprise instead of to, when they get into the, the real clinical condition of type two. 
Yeah, it's just going to add an, a whole extra complexity if we start to include those with diabetes as well. You have to like, you know, look at diabetes, obesity, and and uh, uh, individuals who are normal weight. <laughs> There's just too many groups and too much going on. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a question per se, but our scientific director, Habib Benali, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, and he'd be delighted to welcome you to the Perform Center whenever you're in the area and to further discuss the issues in AD and MCI that you raise. Be my my pleasure to come for sure. I I would have been there if it had been a <laughs> an open meeting, a public meeting. But anyway, next time. Definitely. So it seems we have a very shy audience who doesn't have too many questions. Um, so if no one's going to ask any questions, then we'll just close the meeting today. I just want to thank uh, all of our speakers uh, for your wonderful presentation and to all of our attendees for joining us today. Have a good Thanks afternoon, a lot. everyone. Thank you very much. Interesting talk. Very Same interesting to you. talk. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.